like to share a little bit of my story and uh, hopefully a few helpful tips for you guys today. Uh, I'm originally from California. I uh, lived out in Florida. I went to the University of Miami. I studied electronic media as well as ecosystem science and policy there and worked with the Shark Research Program at the University of Miami for a while. So that's uh, part of the case study that I'll be sharing today. And uh, I've been on the island with uh, my wife for about a year and we've started a media production company out here and having lots of fun with that. Awesome. So yeah, that is me and an oceanic white tip shark. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> glad you can recognize yeah. <laughs> all the fish throw them off sometimes. Yeah. But um, this is out at, uh, in the Bahamas near Cat Island. So today, yeah, I'm going to be talking about the value of visual media. So photography, video, graphic design, infographics, social media, all of that uh, in the context of science, technology, outreach, marketing, that sort of thing. So I'll try and make it as applicable as possible, but also share some of my experiences as well. So photography has the, the power to transport viewers into an unknown realm. It has the power to create a sense of place. The power to spark our innate curiosity. So that's actually a great hammerhead shark just turned from the side, and that's that weird eyeball looking at you there. <laughs> It has the power to capture meaningful memories in the making, like this incredible outreach experience for a high school student alongside of some of the best shark researchers in the world. It has the power to tell a story, something that's not always easy to communicate. All of a sudden, you can share it with the world. It has the power to evoke excitement and wonder and the power to educate and inspire. So I had the good fortune to work with this awesome program called the RJ Dunlap Marine Conservation Program. Their focus was a lot on shark research, but their mission was to advance ocean conservation and scientific literacy by conducting cutting edge scientific research, as well as providing innovative and meaningful outreach opportunities for students by giving them these hands-on research and virtual learning experiences in marine biology. It was really a beautiful blend of marriage between the research and the outreach. So my role with the RGD program, um, I served from 2010 to 2014 out there in Miami, and my goal was to grow their outreach initiative using visual media, so photo, video, and other virtual learning tools. Uh, one of the things I did and with, uh, I created a bit of a legacy with the media internship program. So I first approached these scientists when I was an undergrad student asking, hey, have you ever thought of having a media volunteer intern before? And they're like, no, but it sounds cool. Let's see if we can figure something out. And uh, sure enough, we built it up over the years, became a full-time position, and then I started bringing in new interns. And so now they have every semester three undergraduate interns and graduate students, sometimes two, go in and continue this on with uh, photography and other visual media techniques. <clears throat> I also created and designed uh, content for a new visually driven website uh, called sharktagging.com. And I curated content from some of the top underwater photographers from around the world, <coughs> so it would be very, very impactful. Uh, there's, lots of different, there's lots of different ways to navigate the site, but it's very visually driven and uh, lots of great interactive content there. I also enrich their social media networks, uh, like Facebook, Twitter, blog, with the trip photography. So all these research trips, going out and gathering imagery and sharing it online. Uh, also educational videos and infographics as well. I also created uh, video campaigns for fundraising as well as education. Uh, they're very, very powerful tools uh, when you have moving imagery like that and uh, produce something called video abstracts. Whenever a big publication was released, a scientific journal article, a lot of times uh, it's great in the scientific community, but hard for the public to understand what's going on in those papers. And so I came up with these videos that would kind of just visually communicate what's going on, but in more simple terms, easy to understand terms. So I'm going to play a quick video for you guys here. 
uh, showing one of the is, showing one of the fundraising videos that I did a few years back for the University of Miami. Oops. Sharks, one of the least understood, the most feared creatures in our oceans. Fine tuning their senses through evolution for the last 400 million years, sharks are perfectly adapted to their environment. As top predators, they play a vital role in maintaining the health of marine ecosystems. They keep prey populations in check, as well as remove the weak and diseased individuals, promoting balance in the oceans. Their beauty draws millions of divers into the ocean each year. Unfortunately, many shark populations have declined dramatically over the past 30 years due to overfishing, some by as much as 99%. Studies report that over 100,000 sharks are killed every day, primarily for their fins to make shark fin soup. Today, one-third of all pelagic sharks are threatened with extinction. Thankfully, the tide is shifting. The R.J. Dunlap Marine Conservation Program at the University of Miami is changing the game for sharks worldwide. Led by world-renowned shark biologist Dr. Neil Hammerstein, this team of scientists, educators, and communicators are working to unlock the mysteries of our ocean's apex predators in order to better protect them. One of the most innovative tools we are using to research sharks is a custom-designed satellite tag that records the conditions surrounding the shark and its GPS locations when it comes to the surface. We currently have one of the largest satellite tagging programs on the United States Eastern Seaboard. Our researchers have published dozens of peer-reviewed journal articles, completely altering the landscape of shark conservation and directly influencing public policy. But here is where we need your help. These tags are expensive. It costs $2,500 to purchase a satellite tag and the satellite time required to receive its transmissions. Please take your vested interest in saving sharks. After all, the oxygen from four out of five breaths that we take comes from the ocean. Do you really want to risk that? Join us today. So that was uh, part of a little Kickstarter campaign that they did to raise uh, extra money for the satellite tag. There we go. So the shark tagging trips were the main platform for conducting research as well as doing the outreach with uh, local students. So the RGD program takes out over a thousand high school students every year onto these shark tagging trips with the scientists and science interns from uh, the University of Miami. And these students get a chance to be hands-on, literally helping tag the sharks, measure them, take biopsies, and they're learning at every step of the process really what it takes to conduct scientific research. And it's this hands-on experience that uh, really is an empowering opportunity for them to see what it's like to be a scientist, ask these world-renowned scientists questions throughout the day. You're on the boat hanging out together uh, doing research. And uh, field photography kind of just evolved over the years with it, uh, having a few primary roles, one of which was documenting the participant experience. So these kids, some of them have never been on a boat before uh, from inner city, Miami and they go out on these boats and all of a sudden now they want to remember this for the rest of their life. They got this the day they got to touch a shark for the first time, see it up close. All of a sudden this Jaws-like creature is now this tiny little Atlantic shark nose and they think is so cute and they want to show their mom back home when they get back. Now they have photos to do that. The number of times come back and it becomes their Facebook profile picture for months and months and months because <laughs> it's them touching a shark or doing a tag or something like that. And so it's a great way to continue that outreach experience to perpetuate the conversation, uh, continue increasing the conservation ethic. 
and also helps to illustrate the research process. A lot of you guys uh, in the science world know that communicating methodologies to the public isn't always the easiest thing. Uh, so thankfully, with the SHARK program, it was relatively easy, but I've seen it work in a lot of different types of science as well. So having this visual communication of the process really helps to clarify for the public what's really going on. And then lastly, capturing sharks in a positive light. Uh, I'm sure you guys know, especially here in Hawaii, most of the time you hear about sharks in the media, it's not necessarily a positive story. So this is an opportunity to create a lot of really positive stories about sharks and just mainly their significance ecologically in the oceans and uh, why they really need our help. But also really just interesting stories about how amazing these creatures are, how they've evolved for hundreds of millions of years and uh, just, yeah, awesome information and stories. So some potential impacts from visual media with, uh, with a science lab, specifically this one that I've worked with, was clarifying the research methods and goals for the public. So I kind of touched on that a little bit, but it definitely has been a very helpful component. Um, improving overall scientific literacy. That's one of the mission statements of the RGD program, and I'm sure for a lot of science programs that have an outreach component, they want to increase scientific literacy in the public. And so using photo and video and infographics to really break it down in more simple terms or visual terms, because everybody learns in different ways. So the more ways you can repackage that information and share that, the more likely you're to engage a more diverse audience. Strengthening ocean conservation ethic. Uh, sometimes, like I was saying, kids that would come out on these trips have never been on a boat before. Plenty of people don't know much about sharks other than being scared of them. Occasionally we get people that really just didn't like them or their family would eat uh, shark fin soup on a regular basis for banquets and that sort of thing and had no idea impact of that. And so going through this experience and then being able to share the media from that trip and then also direct their friends and family to the website to engage in other virtual learning tools, very, very powerful experience and very transformative. Inspiring careers in STEM. Uh, I mean, uh, that's definitely a national initiative right now, <laughs> a big push for STEM across all the universities. And so science, technology, engineering, and math really wanting to get more kids and women into science. And so what better way to do that than to share some super cool shark photos? <laughs> I mean, it, uh, whether you love them or you hate them or whatever, everyone's got an opinion about sharks. So it was a relatively easy subject, but even for more uh, abstract concepts that maybe not an iconic ocean animal, uh, if you can find a way to tell that story in an interesting way, you're likely gonna engage some young kids and spark that curiosity, that interest in them. They're like, maybe I wanna go do that. I get to come up with my own questions, go out on the boat and figure out how to answer them. Uh, so it's a really neat way to inspire young kids. And then most importantly for a lot of people that keep their program going is funding. Uh, yeah, sometimes it costs money to make this kind of stuff, but the impact of how much money it can generate for your program and bring in new donors, from the private sector, as well as uh, helping to support your grant proposals for uh, government grants and all that can be really, really big. So I'm gonna take a quick break from the more dense content here and just show you a few more cool photos from the field uh, from over the years. So this is one of my favorites here, a, uh, uh, excuse me, a great hammerhead shark that's just resting on the back of the boat in the water uh, while they attach a satellite tag to it. But, that toothy smile gets you every time. <laughs> just say smile. Yeah, <laughs> toothy smile. <laughs> I know it's just breathing, but I'll just pretend, you know, anthropomorphize them. But, um, so yeah, this is actually a corporate group from Canada that was coming for a, a day on the boat and they were doing a big donation to the program, but then they got to go out on the boat for a day and learn to be a citizen scientist that way. So it's great to reach people from all across. Was that a stuffed shark? Yeah, that was a sharky. <laughs> We've gone through a few generations um, of that, but, but basically showing how to do all the samples before we bring the kids or the citizen scientists to help them measure. So we show uh, all the different uh, data that we'd be collecting that day. And when, then when we don't have Sharky, if he falls off board or whatever, we would just use one of the interns. We're like, okay, just lay down. This is <laughs> thin. <laughs> like, put the tag right here. Um, but, uh, yeah, so lots of fun out on the water. 
these are some of my favorites, are split shots, uh, the over-under shots, because in, in my opinion, it brings these two worlds that are separated by this really opaque thing, the surface of the water. It's so mysterious what's underneath, but when you can bring those two worlds together in one photograph, it can be, in my opinion, very, very powerful. seem very calm underwater, put them on a fishing line, they're hard fighters, <laughs> powerful animals. So are, are these uh, copyrighted and property of Rasmus or? Um, we, I have a uh, copyright, they use them um, mm -hmm. freely, yeah, I can share that. And this is one of the versions of satellite tags on a bull shark there. You can always get in the water with the bull sharks, but on occasion, <laughs> they're a little sketchy. And, uh, so for humans, uh, we often believe that eyes can be a window into someone's soul, right? It's a very powerful thing to have eye contact. In the underwater world, similarly, interacting with animals, eye contact can be a very powerful communication tool. And so one of my favorite parts of sharks to photograph is their eyes. I think it really gives people a chance to connect with sharks in a new way, with something other than just their teeth. And that's a water pump in its mouth, by the way, that uh, helps oxygenate over its gills while uh, doing a quick workup on the boat. OK, so maybe I've sold you on all this, and you're like, but how does this apply to my technology company, my other types of science, physical oceanography? How can you really use visual media in your organization? So here are a few tips uh, for, from my experiences, at least. First being brochures and flyers. It's a given. Most, most companies and uh, organizations will create a trifold brochure to give out. And uh, so here's one of the ones I created for the University of Miami's shark program. And uh, that's a trifold brochure here. And as you can see, again, photography is a great way to grab people. It's that hook. Why are they going to pick up that one? And, uh, and beyond photography, a, a map showing the track of a shark or a map or a graph of your data in a really interesting chart can be a great way to really communicate what's going on or just using uh, graphic design to pull people in and they're like, oh, what's the thousand about? And, you know, really helps tell the story and bring your eye across the page. Scar scholarly articles, as I'm sure you guys have heard of phrase, <coughs> publish or perish in the academic world a lot of times and the, the pressure to do so. But imagine you're putting out this article and now you have this incredibly powerful photo to a company the article, and then the publishers say, hey, can we put that on the cover? <laughs> all of a sudden, you're getting all this extra attention for your new research that you spent so long developing and putting out there doing your thing. You bring in an expert of communication, they can help you get it out there in a much bigger way. Funding reports and grant applications. Sometimes they have very strict rules, as I'm sure you guys know, of what you can submit with it and whatnot. But if you're applying for funding in the private sector from, say, Wells Fargo, they have a big uh, initiative to support uh, environmental causes. Um, throw in photos to get someone to do graphic design for it. It's going to really help your image, your branding <coughs> of your organization, of your lab, and get garner extra attention. Even if they just spend an extra five minutes looking at it, that's an extra five minutes looking at your project that you really want to do. So it can be super. And also, annual reports. A lot of companies, organizations can put out annual reports, but are you fully utilizing visual media with it and integrating it to pull the viewers through? So this report was distributed to all major donors, some potential donors that we wanted to get, also the president of the university, heads of departments. So all of a sudden, this tiny little program is widely known throughout the entire university, the community, and beyond. So it can be a really powerful tool. Uh, here is an example of an infographic showing how many sharks were caught in one year, breaking it down by species. So just coming up with creative ways to share your data. And also engaging people in, uh, so on the side there, Twitter and Vimeo so the, or YouTube, that sort of thing, driving uh, viewers online as well to keep engaging in your content. I always want it like one big loop. <laughs> one sends you to the next, and that sends you to that. So yeah, brings it all together. Website, this day and age, you got to have a website. I'm sure you all know that. <laughs> and uh, it's 
just the first place people look oftentimes to find out about your organization, your research, figure out who you are, your background. And uh, so what's the best thing to have? Photo or video right at the top when they get there. Make it as easy as possible for people to learn what you're about. What better way than just have a press the play button and then it will tell you exactly what's going on. As long as you don't have to wait two minutes for the video to download before you can do anything else. <laughs> yeah, Hawaii, we, maybe sometimes right. photos right. are better. But right. Yeah, exactly. And um, so this was one of the research pages within the website, uh, one of the project pages for a PhD student that I worked a lot with. And uh, so we have video abstract talking about his research here, links to a podcast that brings it around of a radio interview he did, links to the scientific publication. So you just want to collate all this information into really easy to find, easy to navigate. You have lots of people, options of how to uh, connect with your content. Uh, social media. So maybe you've had a lot of people tell you, you've got to have a Facebook page or you got to have a Twitter account. And you're like, I don't really know how to do that. But if you can find someone to help you out with it, it can be really helpful for engaging the public. Uh, using some dynamic imagery to start the discussion about your research. Uh, so this was a new project they were doing with coral restoration, uh, growing little staghorn corals and outplanting them on the reef. And so we linked it and we were looking for funding at that point, helping get donations. And uh, this was a great way to start whole conversations. You gotta have somebody that will stay on top of the comments so they can really educate and use that as a tool, but it can be very, very effective. So maybe now you're like, okay, I really want to use this, but how am I going to get someone to help me with it? So a few options that I would suggest, one being freelance media specialists. So someone you can hire just project to project. You don't want to commit to a whole long thing, but say you just got a great uh, grant proposal approved and it has an outreach component. You have a little bit of budget to hire somebody uh, to help you out with doing an infographic or doing a video. Uh, it can be a great way to do that. If you don't have funding yet, but you want to do this, find a university. Uh, I don't know if Palamanui has some sort of communication course going on. You can connect with them or even distance learning. Uh, a lot of times these classes, they say, okay, we want you to learn these skill sets and these are the projects that you're going to be doing, but they don't have content for you to do as a communication student. They just say, this is the format, but you can figure out the content on your own. Well, then you come in as a scientist or technology expert and say, well, I have some amazing content. I just need someone to package it for me. And you guys work together that way. It's been a very effective relationship that uh, I've helped cultivate with the University of Miami. And I know they do that a bit with University of Hawaii here, but uh, yeah, it's one of my big suggestions. And then say you find an amazing student from that, invite them to do a photo internship, a media internship for you uh, for six months or something like that. Gives them a great chance to dip their toes into the, the real world, if you will, and publish and get it out there. But then it also helps you guys get a little bit of uh, free or cheap labor <laughs> for a while. And then lastly, hiring a full-time media position. I mean, maybe that internship really works out and you were great with that person. Finding a way to get, even if it's private donorship or anything like that, to create a position can be hugely transformative. A good photograph is one that communicates a fact, touches the heart, and leaves the viewer a changed person for having seen it. It is, in a word, effective. It's one of my favorite quotes about photography right there. And so lastly, um, a bit about me here. Uh, since I moved here, started Coral Cove Imagery, boutique media production company. These are a few of the services I offer. Uh, photography and video within a lot of different genres here, but corporate commercial, underwater, science communication, editorial, architecture and resorts, aerial, and also food and product stuff. So uh, if you're interested, be happy to talk with you, see if we can find a custom solution or whatever you guys are looking to do, help reach your goals with your business or organization. And uh, here's my information. If you want to write it down, feel free and uh, open to any questions, even just brainstorming ideas for your organization or business. I'm here, happy to help. Thank you so much. How are you doing out there? Do you make, are you getting customers and stuff? I've been very fortunate. The business has been uh, very consistent uh, and, and doing really well and enjoying it a lot. So 
diversity of clients. What, what's the most uh, popular or most used? Yeah, I mean, lately I've, uh, I've really been trying to listen to the market here and clients' uh, requests for what they want and adapt and, and grow into that. And so that's why I've been adding more and more as I've been going along. But the, the aerial stuff has been really popular as well as my video production has been a great uh, service for the community. There haven't, I mean, there are people that do video production on the island, but the quality that I can deliver is from the broadcast quality and not a whole ton of people can do that in a very creative way or at least have that science background to be able to interpret more complex things and bring it down. You had some great shots of um, sharks on the dive step. Um, I presume you got them there by hook? Yeah, so they okay. use uh, circle hooks with uh, drum lines. So it's a standardized uh, fishing unit deployed for an hour or so of time. And uh, so with those of you that may not know, uh, there's two main types of hooks, J hooks and circle hooks. J hooks, um, you're more likely to catch a lot of things, but it will gut hook them and oftentimes hurt the animal. And so if you want to keep the animal alive, circle hooks are a great way to do that. And they hook most of the time just in the corner of the mouth. And it's kind of like a ear piercing or something like that. It's really easy to cut the hook out and then let it go. And it heals up really, really fast for the sharks. They have amazing immune systems. So, yeah. Is it a barbless hook? Or? No, it has a barb on it. Yeah. You can make a barb, so squish yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but uh, very, very much just uh, great releases. You only the process only takes about five minutes, and then for hammerheads, which are more sensitive, cut it down to two to three minutes maximum, and leave them in the water, and uh, and then release them back right away. So yeah, they they are always in great condition. Well, I can another talk for half an hour about the gear you're using. Oh, how yeah. it's evolved over time and stuff like that. Oh, it was constantly evolving. It was a very innovative yeah. group of scientists that were always looking for ways to. Uh, help keep the sharks in as good a condition as possible because they wanted to keep them alive. They wanted to, they were looking for ways to uh, have the least invasive methodologies possible. So for instance, learning about what they're eating in the ecosystem and how it all connects, they use stable isotope analysis. So just taking a little muscle biopsy uh, and be able to, and blood samples, and then just process those little tissue samples versus killing the shark and cutting its stomach open mm -hmm. and looking what's inside. I was thinking about the photo technology. I, mean, I presume it's all yeah. digital these days. You're not going back to film. No, I learned on film, but I yeah, yeah have adapted to digital over the years, obviously. Yeah. And uh, and so yeah, it's great. I mean, there's so many different tools out there that even uh, a GoPro. I mean, I'm sure a ton of you guys have GoPros and other uh, pretty low cost cameras that they have underwater housing. They can be great ways to tell a story. You don't have to have a ten fifteen thousand dollar rig to tell a great story. It's much more about what you're trying to say, and then how you package it and deliver it to the public. Mm -hmm. Much less about the gear. Yeah. Have you found there are similar opportunities with uh, any of the local UH, I guess, or with any of the local high schools or schools at any level? Yeah, great question. I, uh, I'm definitely just still delving into the community here and would love to talk to any of you guys that have ideas of how to work with schools more. Uh, I haven't delved into that as much because just getting gear, I was looking for kind of a commercial application of my skill sets and building a <coughs> business that way, but I'm excited to be delving back into the science world more. I'm actually going to be, excuse me, working with Nelha here to do some promo videos for them with the new building that they're renovating. So yeah, I'd love to get more into science and bringing in students as well. About a year? Yeah. Probably my best. Place. Have you visited the school across the street yet? Mm -hmm. Established a relationship with them? Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I'm a part of Rotary Club with Tom there. And so, uh, yeah, we did a tour there just about a month ago. Amazing work that they're doing mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Really innovative stuff. How about the media accelerator with the, your classroom? I haven't, um, I've just started learning about them recently, yeah. actually, at one of these uh, Tech Bahamas. And so, uh, yeah, they're on my list of people to go. Yeah. Have you had any contact with Naleo and who are doing video production for the community type things? And that would be, uh, seems like there should be a lot of synergy there. Yeah. Rather yeah, than competition. To, yeah, I'd love to keep 
uh, networking and working together with other groups. And they sure. teach, they have video production classes as part of what they're doing. So. Perfect. Yeah, I love hearing about that. Awesome. Any other questions? Do you have interns? <laughs> Not at this point, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm about at that point, though, that I need to hire somebody on or bring them in. With, um, within which context? So, so I mean, you showed an yeah. amazing presentation on, on you know, how you learn, you know, love of sharks and education and scientists are okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's layering on a lot of stuff. And that's yeah. really, from my perspective, you want them to have very deep content knowledge yeah. to be able to build an effective, you know, communication mm -hmm. school. Right? Yeah, so I, I found that it's very helpful to, um, all scientists can uh, work as great partners, but there are some that are definitely more motivated to be on that cutting edge and learn and, and really try hard to find simplistic language to share their, their message with. And so then you could bring any communicator uh, who would be expert in, but I, I mean, there are some like myself that really enjoy the sciences as well. So when you can find somebody that they both kind of meet halfway <laughs> so that you both have your expertise, but you can speak the same language as well, find that commonality. Not sure if that fully answered your question. Yeah. But. No, I mean, I guess it does. I mean, I'm sort of thinking, you know, as a parent, you know, yeah. as a kid, I'm very interested in science and science mm. and emotion, right? Yeah. I'm really interested in how to communicate that, but it's not, it's not a something you, you know, you typically wouldn't find a scientist being a digital mm. major or a person. Of yeah, I mean, whichever one you're more passionate about, I'd say, use that as a primary. But I kind of always loved science and I loved art growing up and. A lot of times they're like, well, generally it's better just to focus on one thing and get really good at that. And I was like, but I love both. And <laughs> so I found the university that let me double major. So, I mean, you don't have to give up your two interests, but at some point it is somewhat beneficial to find one that you're a little better at or you enjoy a bit more and have that be your primary. But it's, I think it's a great asset to have these uh, extra expertise or at least fluency in another genre. Howard Hood sharks uh, obviously have a peculiar shape. Yes. And they're eyes are at the ends of them. Do we know, or is it known, what survival advantage they have from that unusual configuration? Yeah, there's been some awesome research done, and I'm sure there's some other experts in the field that could probably add to it. But um, from what I've understood about them is that it definitely helps that when they, they kind of swim like this, and so they can stitch together in their brain, um, almost a 360 view of their surroundings and put that together. So it helps to be able to see um, other predators in the area as well as their prey. Um, but it also increases their surface area across that cephalofoil, that hammer. And they have all these little jelly-filled pores called um, ampullae of Lorenzini, uh, which help conduct an electromagnetic current there. And they can sense if a stingray is buried in the sand, they can feel the heartbeat going. And so, you know, like the guys at the beach with the, the headphones and sweeping for a buried treasure, hammerheads can kind of use their cephalofoil that way, sweep across the sand, they find a stingray. One of my favorite things that I have seen some video on and heard it experiences about is they'll pin down the stingray with their hammer on this side, bite the wing off, and then they'll pin down the other side, bite that wing off, then the stingray can't get away and they just eat the rest of it. So. <laughs> They've used it for a few different things. And huh. I mean, just even my experiences with the hammerheads over the years, first, we're very, very gentle with, with the hammer because you're like, oh, they have all these senses. You don't know if touching it's going to really hurt them and all of this. But then and sometimes you'll see them fighting and they're whacking their cephalofoil against the boat <laughs> like it's nothing. So I think they use it as a variety of tools. It's a yeah. So, yeah. Well, and then you just get out of that. You're like, okay, it's your thing. I read some stuff a long time ago about the, the, the increase, the ability, the depth perception mm. improvement because of the wider spacing of the eyes. But uh, there was a lot of work trying to prove that that was the case, and they didn't get anywhere with it. So. <laughs> yeah, a lot of theories. It makes sense, you know. They don't have binocular vision with those two eyes. They've got to take turns. One of the other things is it also puts on their um, their nares, their nostrils, a bit further apart, and they have you know how we can hear in stereo, so we can tell the sounds mm -hmm. coming from the side. 
versus this side, they can do that. Sharks can do that with their sense of smell. They smell in stereo. So they're like, they can tell whether the fish is over there or over there. So having that spread out, I think, could probably help them differentiate the direction as well. Mm. Yeah, go ahead. So with, you know, ecological stories like the shark thing, yeah. it's, you know, maybe not all that optimistic. Or here now we have coral bleaching. Right, this yeah. Enormous, you know, devastating. Um, do you have thoughts on like how you balance, you know, off, like you had a, a few, you know, gory photos yeah. or depressing photos. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but but most of your photos were sort of presenting positive stuff. So, yeah. So just thoughts on that balance and that challenge. That's definitely been a hot topic throughout my whole education and then working experiences as well. Is how to you don't want to be ignorant about these big topics going on, but you also don't want to dwell on it because it's the human spirit the especially general public interest will wane very quickly if you stay on the negative for too long. So I personally try and stay focused on the positive, but definitely throw in those pieces, those key pieces. And if you have something that's really interested in learning more, they can always ask questions beyond it, have some extra resources. But I try and stay away from the negative as much as possible. Just educate those main bullet points that they need to know about the topic, and then beyond that, give them reasons for hope, but also concrete actions, calls to action. What can they do uh, to help you out? Whether it's just simply donating and then you can help them, you can tell them what you're doing with the donations or that they can use less plastic bags or, you know, there's all these different ways, tons of websites and resources online um, that you can give concrete examples of what people can do to help. Um, but yeah, I, I, to answer your question, I generally try and stick to the positive because it's, in my experience, is much more effective. And I actually did a similar presentation about a year ago at an international marine science communication conference, and that was one of the main themes of a lot of talks, was focusing on um, ocean optimism yeah, for communication to Yeah, awesome. Go ahead. So much of what you what you showed was, you know, uh, obviously uh, focused on the photography aspect, mm -hmm. the media aspect, but the, the between print and electronic yeah. uh, billboard or, or dissemination of the yeah. information, uh, did, did you also, you uh, compiled the media, did you also produce the media, you know what I mean? Did you like make the website as well or mm -hmm. did you hand that off to somebody who's a website developer and you give them the package to work with? Depends on the scale of the project. Um, I do have, uh, pretty good understanding of a lot of different parts of digital media, media production, but um, I also have my expertise and I sometimes focus on that more. So for a huge website where we, the University of Miami won there, it was 70 to 80 pages um, within this one website. It was a bit beyond the scope of what I could do in a timely the, the manner. The shark deal was 70 or 80 pages? Yeah, you can still go explore it on your own, sharktagging.com. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's still available very much. You can go explore it. And uh, so that was such a big project. I used the University of Miami web guide to custom design a, a, yeah, a WordPress template and that sort of thing. So then I was mostly doing content production. But uh, yeah, sometimes I do websites as well and, and other things. But then making partnerships, strategic partnerships with other experts in uh, Wait, local not, news or. Uh, so forgive me. Yeah, no, it's okay. Or. Uh, scientific journals or magazines, that sort of thing, to get it out there in bigger ways. That's what I was getting at. If it's not electronic media or, and it becomes mm -hmm. a print media, I yeah. guess, then now you have to go deal with a printer as well, right? So, yeah, yeah, there's a lot less publishing. of the yeah print publishing going on. I mean, there's still that niche out there, but more and more of it is digital. Uh, but those, I mean, you still have those big organizations, Scientific American or uh, Popular Science Magazine, big National Geographic, yes. Uh, and then also, I worked a lot with Discovery Channel. Uh, they have, up in Canada, they have a program called Daily Planet, the world's only daily science news show, science and technology news show, and it's been running for about 20 years now. And uh, so, and they have a great set of producers up there that are much more about telling the facts than about sensationalizing. So I worked a lot with them and enjoyed that. So there's strategic relationships out there to get Awesome. So, is that all right? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm excited. Yeah. Can I just put everything on the table? So, but there you're obviously more interested in helping people develop an issue, something like social media. Yeah. Okay. Well, generate more funding.
doing for your research? What are you doing so far? What are you getting this? Is it okay? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's uh, there's it's a lot about strategy. So every organization is individual. I mean, we make a uh, mission statement, what we really plan to accomplish in the world. So just like uh, big corporate brands hire marketing firms, PR firms to help them create strategy to accomplish their goals, which would be more sales, that sort of thing. Scientists can do the same thing, um, which is, I know the budgets aren't always the same, <laughs> but uh, there are people like me out there that offer those services, even if it's just to help you brainstorm for a couple hours of what you can do as an individual. Uh, taking that time to strategize can make a big difference. How are you doing with the employees? Is it pretty busy? Yeah. Is this company you got is, uh, is some customer companies? Yeah, I mean, I was just saying one of my uh, recent clients that I've taken on here is Yamaha, actually helping them with the new incubator building that they're coming up to get it offered in a bigger way. And uh, so, yeah, I'm going to. Always open to new clients and helping people further their, their messages and their work. PR, so. Yeah, PR marketing and uh, yeah, content development. Awesome. Thank you All so right. much, guys. Yeah. So much.